Hi everyone, in this video we're going to cover probably one of the scariest topics that people think exists in JavaScript and that is the topic of closures. Now as you'll see shortly it's really not that scary and there are a few basic things to understand and once you understand them closures are as simple to understand as anything else you want to see in JavaScript. So let's get started. So in terms of context I want to say that closures really fall this gray area. They fall this gray area between functions and variable scope. So we all know what functions are, we all know a lot about variable scope, and closures are really the intersection of it. And we'll see some examples where you'll see this diagram come to life through code, but just keep the diagram in mind as we're looking through some of the examples, as you'll see shortly. So the key to understanding closures is this. The first thing is to know how functions within functions work. Now, that sounds really bizarre, but once you see a few code snippets, it'll totally make sense. So let's just talk about a very simple case something that everyone should be very familiar with, a function returning a value. So in this case, I have a function called calculate rectangle area. It takes two arguments, length and width, and returns a multiplication. Um, it multiplies those arguments and returns that value back to whatever it calls it. So in this case, I have a variable called room area, and I'm initializing it to calculate rectangle area and passing the arguments 10 and 10. Okay, so far so good. And then I have the alert statement that prints the value of room area. So given what this code does, passing in 10 and 10 multiplies that value together and returns it. So room area stores a value of 100. So if you were to run that code, the room area variable points to 100, run the alert statement on it, prints the word number 100 onto your screen. See, pretty simple, right, so far? Now, let's talk about a function returning a function. Now we're getting a little bit more complicated. So as you know, you can return all sorts of things from a function. You can return simple values, you can return objects, you can return functions, as you see in this example. So a function called you say goodbye. It has a simple statement inside it called alert, which is goodbye first. And within it, I have a function called and I say hello, which has an alert statement by itself inside it. And the last thing the you say goodbye function does is returns the value of and I say hello, which in this case is a function by itself. So take a moment to look at what this code does. And if you look at it, here's what happens. So let's say we want to visualize what this function is doing. There's an outer function, which is you say goodbye, and there's an inner function, and I say hello. And you can see it kinda, you know, these two boxes kinda represent the parent-child relationship of these two functions. Now here's what's important. Now let's say that I want to do something very similar to what I did earlier when I was calculating the, the width of a, the area of a rectangle. I want to initialize a variable called something and I'm going to set it to the value of the you say goodbye function, the outer function that is out there. Now, once I do that, look at what happens. Function you say goodbye gets called, the alert statement goodbye prints, and then the function that I say hello is what gets returned. So here's what it actually looks like. So initialize something variable, we'll print out goodbye because that's part of the you say goodbye function itself. And then the reference to and I say hello is what basically gets returned. Now, that seems straightforward, right? And here's like a, a visualization of what that particular item looks like. And so I have something variable. It is pointing to the and I say hello function. If I want to invoke that, all I would do is just this. I would just put the something variable, add the opening and closing parentheses, and you're done. The inner function gets called and the word hello gets printed on screen. So that is all pretty straightforward. Now, where do closures come into play? So, so far we looked at, you know, a function returning a value and a function returning a function. So closures get involved when the return inner function, it, it isn't self-contained. Now, there's a lot of jargon, and you'll see what it means when I get to the example that kind of highlights this more clearly. So in this case, what we have is an outer function, you say goodbye, inner function, and I say hello. Now, the inner function, and I say hello, is considered self-contained because notice what it have here. You have the alert hello, and there's nothing this function is doing, nothing in its day-to-day -day operation that requires a value or some input from the outer function. There's no variable that is dangling from you say goodbye or something outside of it. It's just literally printing the word hello. It's a primitive, it's just located all within its function, and it's contained, and it's, that's why we call it self-contained. It is not reliant on anything from outside of whatever the scope is this function is operating in. Now, the thing is, that's not real life. Most examples you're gonna be creating where you have functions within functions aren't gonna be so nice and self-contained. They're gonna be complicated, they're gonna be messy, they're gonna be kinda of like this. So here I have a function called stopwatch. And this stopwatch, I have a variable called start time. And I'm initializing the value of date that now, basically the current time. And inside of it, we have an inner function called get delay. Now the interesting part of get delay is that inside the get delay function, we have another variable called elapsed time. 
and elapsed time is subtracting the current time from the value of start time, which is, as you can see, declared by the stopwatch function outside of the get delay value, get delay function. And then I'm learning the, the result of what get delay prints out. But just like you saw with the earlier hello and goodbye functions, what the, I'm ultimately returning though is, a, is the inner function, get delay itself. So the way you use it is this, you, know, you have var timer equals stopwatch, and that gets initialized to essentially this function gets called, start time runs, and then the value that gets returned is the get delay inner function. As, you know, as the name stopwatch implies, what we're doing is trying to find how long something takes between the, the timer value getting initialized and the timer actually getting invoked. So it's kind of artificial that we're forcing a delay by just looping the variable i through a large amount of time. Ignore what this code does. Basically, we're just creating a delay and then we want to invoke the return function to see what the, how much time has elapsed between the line where I'm saying timer equals stopwatch to actually calling the inner function, which is get delay. That's basically what we're doing. So now here's what the visualization of that looks like. So let's look at an incomplete visualization. So if we had to look at what's going on here, you know, we have stopwatch initialized, it could, the value get delay gets returned. The, the simplified view of this would be timer, that's the variable, and it, there are two boxes, the outer function stopwatch, inner functions get delay. And that is a very simplified way of looking at it, but uh, as you can see by the title of the slide, it is also incomplete. It's incomplete because, let's look at the inner function one more time. You know, I called this out earlier, but let's look at it one more time in detail. You know, the elapsed time variable, notice that it has two things that it's calculating. One is date at now, which is fine. That is uh, something that is local to this function. It just may call it at this point. And then it is subtracting the value of the current time from the start time. And look at the start time. It is not contained within this function. It is contained outside of it. So the question I ask is, what do you think happens to elapsed time's dependence on a start time variable. You know, what happens? Does it disappear? Does it stick around? Well, that's the interesting thing. See, the JavaScript runtime is really smart. It keeps track of all your variables, memory usage, references, and so on. You know, like I say, it's kind of clever like that. Now, when the runtime detects that an inner function relies on variables stored by an outer function, as in this case, get delay is relying on a variable, in this case, start time, stored by the outer function, which is stopwatch, what it does is this. It ensures that those variables are available even if the outer function goes away. So here's what another visualization of that looks like. So the complete visualization is this. Our timer value does in fact point to get delay like we looked at earlier. But the thing is, get delay isn't just hanging there all by itself because it is dependent on the value of start time, which is the variable declared by the stopwatch function. Even that variable is considered in play when the timer value variable is initialized to stopwatch. So not only do you get, get delay, you also get start time as well. And the, the punchline is this. This combination of the function and the, the variable that the function relies on, that is called a closure. That's it, pretty simple, right? So if you look at the definition of it, it's basically this. A closure is a function plus the outer context. The function is something that's created or returned by another function. And the outer context is basically a fancy word for saying variables of this function basically relies on. And so with that, there you have it. A very quick overview of how to work with closures. See, closures aren't really all that hard. I just think it's complicated because I often find on the net, they just aren't explained really well. Simply put, all you're doing with the closure is returning a function, and that function re relies on variables declared by the outer function, as in the case of our stopwatch, you re return both that outer variable along with the function, the inner function that's being returned, and the combination of the closure. That's it, pretty simple, nothing, nothing more to it. So with that, if you wanna learn more about closures or anything else that interests you, go to croup.com, whole bunch of articles on web development. If you need any help, post in the forums at forum.croup.com. I and other people will be happy to help you out. And of course, you can find me all over the place. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you found this particular video interesting and you like the content you see on the website, you, you really want to read books, you know, if you're still into the whole book reading thing, by all means, there's probably a book on this topic. I've written many books so far, and there's definitely a book that covers closures and other JavaScript topics, like my JS 101 book, for example. So go ahead and search for my name on Amazon or click here if you can on this link here and you'll see all the books that are out there. So with that, I will see you guys next time.